Okay, let us start uh, our second presentation of the day. Uh, I'm excited to announce our next speaker, Vera Semenova from the University of California, Berkeley. After completing two undergraduate degrees, Vera earned a master's from Cambridge across the ocean, and then she moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts to work on her doctoral dissertation at MIT. Vera has formidable background in mathematical statistics, which she applies to the most difficult and important problems in econometrics and machine learning. Without further ado, Vera, we are looking forward to learn from you about the newest methods for co causal inference. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's my honor to be here. So today I will be talking about machine learning for causal inference and specifically for a, um, for a, prob for a problem in dynamic discrete choice. And this is joint work with uh, my former advisors, Viktor Chernozhukov and Whitney Nui. Um, sorry, just, just to check, is the connection going fine? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, and we see your arrow. Okay, thank you. So modern data sets often have many covariates for observation that can make computation and inference difficult. And in the area of computer science, there have been, uh, has been a class of methods called machine learning that have achieved impressive out of sample prediction performance, uh, where the goal is to predict a label given a vector of characteristics and a training set. In addition to prediction, in economics, we often care about different goal, which is to estimate some economically meaningful parameter and quantify uncertainty about it. For example, average treatment effect or some structural parameter. Therefore, so the goal is slightly different from machine learning. However, such parameters often depend on unknown functions of covariates. For example, the propensity score or conditional choice probability that are essentially conditional mean functions and they can be viewed as a prediction problem. Therefore, the question is, can we import machine learning tools to estimate these unknown functions and ultimately quantify uncertainty about the treatment effect? The recent work by Victor Chernyshuka and Whitney Nui, as cited here, uh, shows how to do it for, <clears throat> for a certain class of parameters. Uh, but the, pro the question that has been lift left out so far was estimating of average uh, welfare in dynamic discrete choice problem. And today I will be talking about this problem and how we can apply machine learning tools to estimate average welfare and average value function when the state space is high dimensional. So just to set the ground, let me start with a classic problem in dynamic discrete choice, which is the RASP problem and augment it with a high dimensional component. So in each period of time, an agent decides whether to keep or to replace a bus where time runs a perpetuity and is discounted by some factor beta. Um, if agent decides to replace a bus, which is shown by action A equal to zero, he incurs a replacement cost R and otherwise, if he decides to maintain the bus, he incurs the replacement cost mu s that is proportional to mileage s. Because in the data for the same set, for the same value of the mileage s, we see different choices a, we need to rationalize them somehow. And therefore, we assume that agent has some private information encoded in the shock epsilon, and his utility is the sum of the predictable part that I've just described plus the private shock that the researcher doesn't see. And um, we, observe, we observe the actions that come from the optimal strategy. In a, in a classic RASP model, the future mileage S depends on the current mileage ST and the action A. But in, we can imagine that in real life and um, in a more complex problem, the future mileage depends not only on this current mileage and the action, but also on the heterogeneous characteristics on where the bus operates. For example, city characteristics or root characteristics that for the purpose of the problem, I will assume to be static. So these characteristics do not depend on time. They don't have evolution, but they impact how mileage evolves. 
And because they impact the mileage evolution, they are also part of the optimal policy and they are part of the state vector X. Uh, so they have to be taken into account in the policy. My goal is to estimate and provide a confidence interval for the expectation of, um, sorry, and provide, and provide um, confidence interval for the expectation of the value function Vx, where Vx describe the total value of my bus business if I start in the state X. And the expectation is taken with respect to the marginal distribution across the cities or across the routes. And the main difficulty here is that value function depends on this density that you need to estimate. In computer science application, this transition density sometimes is interpreted as known, but economics, we, where we need to estimate it because we don't know it. Uh, the density describes some process that, we, that is not under our control. Therefore, the density needs to be estimated and likewise the choice probabilities needs to be estimated as well. And when X is high dimensional, we would like to use some re modern regularized methods to estimate them and plug them into the value function. So here is the main difficulty that comes here, uh, that appears when you try to do it naively or directly. Suppose you use logistic Lasser to estimate the conditional choice probability. Because Lasser regularizes your solution, ultimately some covariates will, that impact the optimal choice and the mileage will be left out by Lasso and they will become part of the error term. As a result, this part of the error term will now be correlated with the true solution and this correlation creates bias known as regularization bias. And this bias is of the, uh, uh, in, the, in terms of the order of magnitude, it is greater than the root n scaling at which we, can, at which we apply central limit theorem. Therefore, this direct naive plug-in of the regularized methods into the value function will create a biased estimate that will not be directly helpful to, to, to construct a confidence interval for it. So that's the main problem. And in this talk, I will, talk, I will propose a solution to this problem. The main idea for the solution is to adjust the construction for the value function, which is the second stage, to make it insensitive with respect to the first stage bias. This idea has been previously known in literature as orthogonality, and um, it has been known since the work of Niemann in 1959 um, that, show, that introduced orthogonality in likelihood models. And then it was connected to machine learning by the work of Viktor Chernozhukov and Whitney Newey. However, this, uh, this work by uh, Victor, it relies on the closed form expression, of the moment equation or the likelihood, something that you, you can directly differentiate, which doesn't happen for the value function because value function is not uh, something that you can directly compute. So in this talk, uh, I will introduce implicit orthogonalization that helps the value function to be adjusted and so that we can compute it based on machine learning estimates. So a brief literature review. Um, of course, this work relies on past work on the models for orthogonality. It also relies on dynamic discrete choice models. And in particular, we view our paper as a modern version of Agil Gabiri and Mira. Uh, this is a paper that introduced um, asymptotic theory for dynamic discrete choice models, uh, but where everything is parametric, so the whole model is described by finite dimensional vector, including the evolution and the utility and everything. So we view ourselves as a, an extension of it where the state space no longer has to be discrete. Um, it, in fact, each state component can be either discrete or continuous and there can be many of them. So, so for, uh, in the following of the talk, I will describe how orthogonalization works for the case of average expect of the average value function where we're not weighting it by any function. And then I will generalize my results to the weighted average. Uh, so let's start. Let me briefly introduce notation. X here shows the state variable. Vx shows the value function. And the first stage parameter that, it does, that Vx depends on is the conditional choice probability Px 
and the transition density of the future state x prime given the current state x and the action a. Uh, well, your function is defined uh, as a solution to a Bellman equation, and it's something that describes, it's, it's a function that describes the total value, total discounted value, assuming this agent plays optimally. Uh, it is well known that this value can be, can be decomposed into the current per period utility, u, uh, the current epsilon shock, and the continuation value that is discounted by the discount factor beta that I assume to be known. Uh, this is a very helpful equation and we'll use it to establish one helpful property. But a problem of it that it is not linear in V, there is this maximum involved here. And therefore taking an expectation in and out will be difficult. For that reason, I will use another property of the value function called recursive property, where uh, value function is expressed in terms of current expected utility. So the agent, before he sees the realization of this private shock epsilon, he has an ex anti expectation of this, of his current per period utility at a given policy. And this is continuation value that is integrated against the shock again. So this is expected, uh, the same expectation is above that is integrated over the policy. For the example we have seen previously in the, in the second slide for the Rust problem, the utility has this well known expression where this is the sum of the replacement cost times probability of uh, replacement times, um, sorry, replacement cost times maintenance cost uh, times the probability of maintenance plus the total expected shock at a given policy P. Um, I will abstract away from computing V, which is the theory will apply for the true solution if V as if someone has provided it to us. We're still working on a good way how to simulate V from the, from the estimates, uh, but it's still helpful because um, it, it's the first step towards incorporating machine learning techniques for uh, value function estimation. Um, so in this slide, I will show what why orthogonalization is important and what happens if you do not orthogonalize. Imagine you use some machine learning techniques to estimate the density and the choice probability on some auxiliary sample. And then you decided to simulate your value function from these estimates and take the sample average across your data points on the main sample. Uh, the expected behavior is something that you can see on these plots where the solid line shows the distribution of the estimator that is simulated from the true first stage. And the histogram shows the distribution of the feasible estimator where I have used regularized techniques in the first stage. And as you can see that the histogram is shifted relative to the true curve, which is the, re the, reason, the reason for it is this bias that we're trying to get rid of. So by the end of the talk, we will see the hist histogram where that is directly under the curve, and it will be the indication that we have removed the bias. So let me begin by um, removing the bias of the choice probability. Uh, P0 here is the true choice probability, and P is the candidate value. The bias, the, the bias of the um, choice probability is proportional to the derivative of the value function at P0. But where, and the question is where do we find this derivative? Because normally this is something that we know in closed form problems, but here we have to compute it. And it turns out that if you differentiate Bellman equation, you will find a contraction mapping equation for the derivative, which will be the exact proof why this derivative is zero. So going slower here, if you take the derivative with respect to the Bellman, uh, you can bring it through the maximum and through the expectation by the envelope argument, as long as you condition on the optimal action. But when you bring it through, you will see that there is no P involved in, um, uh, oh, thank you for your question. Is the distribution of the naive estimator always approximately bell-shaped? Is it always normal? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. Let me answer it um, towards the end of my talk. I'll just uh, think about it for a moment. 
Um, yeah, sorry, uh, let me continue from here. <clears throat> so when I'm bringing the derivative through, I'll see that uh, utility, the current propriety utility doesn't depend on P. So this derivative is zero. The only thing that depends on P is this continuation value. Um, this continuation value, and here is how this contraction e mapping equation emerges. Therefore, the only possible value for the derivative to be is zero. And um, it's the unique solution. Therefore, value function at the optimal policy is already automatically orthogonal with respect to choice probability. And the plot, the story I have just told you, it doesn't apply if the only source of bias is the choice probability. So if you know your true density and your, and your choice probability is estimated at a sufficiently high quality so that uh, the second order terms do not matter, then it's already first order orthogonal and you don't have to worry about anything. But this property is true only if you are talking about the optimal policy. Once you deviate from optimality, this argument breaks and the first order terms start appearing. So now um, let me move to the density case. From Agir, Gabiri, and Mira, we know that um, they, we have to have some, some contribution of the density estimation to the value function because they had as well in parametric case. Gamma here, gamma naught here represents the true transition density and gamma represents some candidate value of the transition density. And uh, per, this is just a way of simply simplify math where I will I represent gamma naught by gamma naught the true density and by gamma the candidate density. Likewise, I take the Taylor expansion and I'm interested in this derivative of the value function with respect to gamma. But no longer, I can use Bellman because um, Bellman is not linear, so it will be difficult for me. So instead I use the recursive property that I introduced. So let me trace where gamma appears in this property. Because gamma is a parameter of the density, it does not appear in the current, uh, current uh, utility because it's only about the current choice. However, it appears in the continuation value in two places, inside the value function, just how we introduced it. But it also appears outside, as shown in red, because when you take expectation of your future state, you're taking it with respect to some density, and that's the density. This is this the outer part that I'm talking about. Therefore, when you take the derivative, um, you will have two terms corresponding to the inner and to the outer part. Mm, and I would like to find this derivative. So I will make one extra assumption, which is not required for the general case for the archive paper, but just to simplify mass for the purpose of the talk, I will assume that current and future state have the same distribution under the optimal policy. And if this is true, then take an expectation on both sides, we'll return the same term on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side that is multiplied by beta. Therefore, I can re uh, rearrange my math and, exp and find the expression for the derivative. And this is the very expression I was looking for. I see that it is, it's equal to the beta over one minus beta times expectation of the value function in the future state times the conditional score. And this is a already success because now from here, I can directly go to the orthogonal moment, uh, to the orthogonal representation of the value function and get rid of the bias that I've just talked. So there are certain steps here that are not shown because uh, they are somewhat um, algebraically involving, but there is a theorem that tells you that if you have this representation on the top that involves a conditional score, then the correction term for the value function will be equal to the residual of the value of whatever is multiplying this score minus its expectation given x. So from here to here, there is a theorem that allows you to, to move from one step to another. So the total orthogonal expression for the value function is the sum of the original value function plus this residual, which is the value function at the future state x prime 
minus its projection on the current state, multiplied by this factor that uh, depends on the continuation value. Uh, in particular, when beta is equal to zero, when, which means that I have no dynamics in my problem, uh, you see that this term drops out. And this is because density um, doesn't matter anymore. If, if there is no dynamics in my problem, uh, I don't need to correct for anything. On the one hand, is if beta is approaching to one, this looks like it's exploding and it's as it should be because um, value function has a, is properly defined for values that are less than one, where beta is less than one. So this is an expression for the orthogonal moment for the value function. And um, I will talk about this property in a second. Let uh, just me say at this moment, when you use an orthogonal expression rather than the original value function, the hope is that the distributions will be aligned. Now, at this stage, let me answer the question from the chat box, which was, um, sorry, which was asked whether the, when I have a bias, will the distribution will be bell-shaped? Um, the answer is yes, because I'm using different samples here. And um, for that reason, conditional on that sample, these P hat and F hat are treated as fixed parameters. So this is a sample average. And the sample average is centered somewhere, but it's normal around that center. In case of orthogonal moment, it's centered correctly. But in case of non-orthogonal moment, it could be centered at the wrong point. Uh, let me briefly pause here if there are any questions so far so before I move to the next um, before I move to the next step. So so far, the main takeaway is just to remember this representation of the value function where the density appears in two places and therefore two colors are used to indicate its instances. Okay, before we move on, there is one extra useful property here, which is, um, is if I'm concerned about the average welfare, I actually can make, um, I can use a misspecified, maybe incorrect transition density because the expectation of the orthogonal moment does not depend on it. The whole point is that uh, the density drops out from the expectation. Therefore, you can use just completely wrong density and it will not affect the expectation. If you want to have a correct confidence interval for the value function, your density still has to convert to the truth at some rate because besides bias, there is also variance that has to, uh, that has to converge. But this argument is showing that density has no first order effect, no second order effect, and no any effect on the orthogonal moment. Um, just robust to misspecification. Now let me just make a quick overview what happens in the general case where there is a non-trivial weighting function w that is multiplying the value function. And let me motivate why this is an interesting problem. So besides the basic average, we could be interested in truncated average welfare where we have truncated our attention only to the value function that is between its 0.25th and 0.75th quantile. This is not a linear expression in terms of value function, but you could linearize it. And this linearization will be of interest. Alternatively, you could be interested in the average partial effect with respect to some continuous variable x1. So if x1 is mileage and x is mileage plus characteristics, you could be interested in the average effect in small change in the mileage. Uh, and this has this type of weighted average representation. And finally, um, uh, and finally, there is also a counterfactual policy effect of st James stock from changing the distribution of the mileage. It also has this type of representation. So that's why weighting also is interesting to consider. Uh, let me, when I state the results for the weighted case, I will point back to the average case. So first, just in the average case, the choice probability estimation doesn't have any first order effect on the weighted average. If you recall, 
we have established this orthogonality property for each value of the derivative at each point x. Therefore, weighting doesn't matter. Now, for the correction term for the density, we have a more complex function that is multiplying this residual we have just introduced. This the multiply lambda depends on the weighting in a way that when you plug in the weighting function equal to one, this lambda will reduce to one over one minus beta. So we will back to our basic average case, which is where this uh, multiplier is beta over one minus beta. The robustness argument, which is I've briefly mentioned, where the density doesn't have to converge uh, at any particular rate, becomes a double robustness requirement, which is a classic um, requirement in semi-parametric econometrics for orthogonal moment equations, where you have a product condition involving uh, the original first stage function and this additional multiplying function that you need to estimate. In the basic average case, lambda was known because it was beta over one minus beta. Therefore, this term was automatically zero. But in more general case, lambda involves this weighting function. It needs to be estimated, and therefore, there is an additional product condition appearing. Um, so that's the brief um, mapping to the um, average uh, case. Uh, so far, the results I have shown relied on the stationarity of the marginal distribution. Let me formally explain what stationality means and explain what to do when there is, it doesn't hold. Uh, a, mar a, a sequence of states x, x double prime, etc. It's called a stationary sequence if you can add t periods uh, to and, and uh, have the same distribution of the sequence. For example, mileage is Rust in Rust is viewed to be stationary because if you plot the histogram of the mileage uh, in the first and the second in the, in the period, it will look the same regardless of the period you're considering. So this is a useful property that has helped us to simplify, uh, to derive results we have just seen. Uh, and this is the correction term that we have seen in case, uh, in a stationary case. When there is no stationarity, we have to consider the full pass of the actions and states and therefore the correction term becomes slightly more complicated. And in particular, you will have to consider the residuals uh, that involve the whole sequence. However, if it's stationary, the term simplifies this beta case, sum up to one over one minus beta, and you can use a different residual that involves only current and future state. Um, stationarity could be viewed as a strong restriction and in particular, it's a property that relies on uh, optimal, optimal policy. But in economics, sometimes we want to consider also suboptimal policies because we obtain identification. So we obtain conclusions by comparing what happens at an optimal policy and what happens at a suboptimal policy. Therefore, this stationarity argument, it is not applicable for suboptimal policies and we will need to use a more complicated correction term for the suboptimal policies. Um, now, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that we are also interested in quantifying uncertainty uh, for the true parameter, which is expected weighted average. And by that, I mean just to provide a confidence interval that covers this true parameter with a pre-specified probability. A classic way of doing it would be to use weighted bootstrap where I generate weights, uh, exponential weights that are drawn independently from data. And I do this B times. And for each, for each time, I obtain an estimate. So if I do this B times, I now obtain a histogram that I can use to construct a confidence interval. Uh, a very useful part of orthogonality here is that in um, bootstrap, I need to resample only my second stage. I can, I can just directly plug in the first stage estimate uh, that is estimated on auxiliary sample once. So it's not resampled. Uh, this is an additional benefit of orthogonality compared to non-orthogonal procedures. So in non-orthogonal case, if you do bootstrap, you will have to resample both the first and the second stage uh, every time. 
So it would be quite difficult to reestimate machine learning method for each bootstrap repetition. But because you're orthogonal, you don't need to do that. You can just once reestimate it and plug it in into each uh, second run, bootstrap second run. Um, so just this is formal statements. Uh, we be, beyond uh, beyond the establishing orthogonality, we have shown that as, uh, the sample average of the value function at the machine learning estimate p hat that converges sufficiently fast is the same as the value function estimated at the true choice probability p zero plus an additional terms that do not matter for the central limit theorem scaling. So central limit theorem scaling is at root n. And um, at this order, these additional terms do not matter. Uh, so this is the result in case the transition density is known. In case the transition density needs to be estimated, uh, we need to use the orthogonal moment equation G rather than the value function B. But the result looks very similar, except that you have more functions to estimate. So in addition, the choice probability and the density you have to estimate this multiplier that came out of orthogonalization. But if you are after average welfare multiply, lambda is known as beta or one minus beta, so we don't need to estimate it. So that's the summary, um, sort of the main formal result you can use to, to construct a confidence interval for the weighted average welfare. And um, let me just summarize. So we, the goal was summarize the talk the goal was to estimate and provide a confidence interval for the expected weighted average where Vx is a value function and Wx is a weighting. Uh, the key point here is that this parameter is orthogonal automatically with respect to conditional choice probabilities. The correction term changes from um, beta times the residual or to beta times the residual times this multiplier function lambda. Um, robust, complete robustness property of the weighted average turns into the double robustness requirement. And we have also relaxed stationarity. So that's the overview of the weighted average case. And just um, the overview of the talk is that orthogonality is a good way to import machine learning techniques to estimate the final parameter because it allows us to be insensitive with respect to regularization bias. Uh, a cost of using an orthogonal procedure is that you have no, now more functions to estimate and it's typical uh, for other problems as well. But if we are after average welfare, this is not true because our multiplier is a known number, beta or one minus beta. And uh, we have derived an orthogonal moment equation for the value function. Uh, that you have seen. So yeah, sorry. Um, so that's my concluding remarks. I'm happy to, to take questions at this stage. Um, let me see if there are any. Thank you, Vera. Actually, there was a question about literature. So your last slide was right on spot on. Uh, <laughs> uh, Huiwen Xu was asking, can you please uh, share the two papers mentioned in, in this one of the first slides? I believe this is a, these are papers of Chernozhukov and uh, 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 Nui. Yes, I uh, sure. Um, let me. I, I meant the papers. Maybe just show them in the, in this list. Uh, yeah, that's great. Sorry. Well, okay, great. There they are. This is the two papers that I meant. Let me. That's what I meant. That's the two papers I mentioned in the beginning. Um, did I answer your question? I tried to. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's the answer. Um, okay, I do not see uh, more questions, uh, so I will use this opportunity to ask my question. Um, this stationarity uh, assumption, I wonder, uh, is it, uh, obviously it's, it's a strong assumption, if, but I wonder, is it possible to add um, a, an, an additional step in, the, in your procedure and correct for the uh, non-stationary distribution so that it becomes stationary and you the rest of the 
approach uh, go through? Uh, I mean, you will lose some efficiency, but potentially it's possible, no? So I think stationarity is something that is out of our control when we estimate, because we're not generating the data, we just have the data we have, some, and stationarity may, not, may or may not hold for them. Specifically, when, the, when it does, uh, but stationarity is a joint assumption on policy and on the transition, on the evolution. And therefore, in case an economist would like to consider suboptimal procedures, a family of them, stationarity cannot be the way to go because it cannot hold simultaneously for all your suboptimal candidates. It can only hold for one candidate and for evolution. So it's typically assumed for the optimal policy. That's why there was a case for the uh, relaxation stationarity. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, does it answer your question? Mm, uh, well, yeah, more, yeah I'm, I'm not sure how we make it. In short, basically, no. <laughs> that <laughs> is, it is what it is. Either you have stationarity or not. That's your answer. Yeah. It's, oh. it, I, I was just thinking of uh, stationarity, non stationarity, a very simple kind of stationarity. Uh, 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 something that grows at a constant rate. So strictly speaking, this is it is non-stationary, but it's very easy to correct. You know. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. I guess I would use the um, the non-stationary case just to be safe. By the way, uh, you mentioned that uh, the standard assumption was uh, uh, bounded uh, second-order derivatives. Yeah, thank you for that. Does it uh, in any way interplay with stationarity? No, that's a different sort of, it's a different um, context, context. So bounded second derivative is needed so that you can focus only on the first order terms, which I did in the talk. This bounded second derivative allows you to, to say that everything after first order is unimportant as long as the first stage parameter converges at n minus one quarter rate. Because, because it's second order, you take n minus one quarter, take it to the square, it becomes n minus one half, so a bounded derivative makes it negligible. Uh, and in the talk, I just said that value function problems are indeed have, do indeed have this bounded derivative property uh, under plausible mild assumptions on their parameters. Uh, but it, it, this argument doesn't rely on stationarity in any way. It's true for both stationary and non-stationary problems. Okay. I do not see other questions. Well, we all, all almost finished with time. So let us close this session uh, for now and Thank you very much, Vera, for uh, yeah, you. Uh, revealing presentation. And uh, we will uh, reconvene in one hour, 15 minutes for, uh, for a talk by Juan Camilo Castillo. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good lunch or breakfast or supper, depending on your time zone. <laughs>